there's a girl that oh. was drowning. Oh, no. So I, I went down trying to save her and I almost died. I did not expect the story to go that I way. Didn't, did she make it? No, I wasn't naked. on guys we're here with another episode of the after hours podcast uh we have a very very special guest today i don't even think he needs an introduction uh joining us is steven ducks who is a uh, bit of a legend in the small cap space so thank you for coming on steven hello guys how are you guys doing good man good. so i have a, so i know there's a trading podcast and we're gonna get into trading and questions like that but selfish, yeah, yeah, yeah. i have my own question is I hear you're a bit of a car guy. So I want to know what your car collection looks like these days. Uh, cars. Uh, right now I have a S580, the Mercedes Benz. Um, have a Rolls Royce. What's the, what's the, uh, I think okay, it's so Ghost. Ghost. Um, Ghost. Dope. Yeah. That is dope. Um, I also have a Koenigsegg, uh, Regera. <laughs> um used to have a svj but sold that one because that one was giving me headaches so <laughs> is the one that i'm most interested in how'd you end up deciding to get that car because that's like a multi-million dollar car it's specially built christian von Koenigsegg, the whole thing so how'd you end up deciding to get that car uh, i always wanted to get one I and mean, just um as i said i need to make i don't know multi-million dollar in one trade that's that's you know, <laughs> a uh, trick. <laughs> yeah. which, which trade paid for that car? Uh, initially, it started with with uh, DWAC. That was oh. uh, Donald yeah, Trump. Uh, it was the was, Trump car. Yeah, yeah well, well <laughs> it, it, not necessarily a Trump car, but it was. Uh, and that was, I think, close to six million, right? It was six million then. The following day was three. The following day was four. So it was. Was that your biggest? Uh, was that your biggest single one day winner? That DWAC? Uh, I think so. Yeah. Well, at first thing first, buy the coin side, huh? Uh, didn't didn't count trade zero though because it was doing it uh, with trade zero as well. So it was a little bit more than six million. But oh, goddamn, that's just that's incredible. How did it, how did it feel to? not only have a trade like that, but to celebrate it with an unbelievable reward, which is a car. And second question is, how does the car drive? <laughs> How's that? What's it like? <laughs> uh, the, the, the car has its special sound. It sounds like, I don't want to say ghost because it has a ghost uh, sign on the car. Um, it has that weird noise. It sounds pretty good. Uh, other than that, it's uh, got two batteries. It's, uh, I think it was, uh, V V A, yeah, two batteries and V A. I think it was one sixteen hundred horsepower. So, do you drive it often, or do you drive the Benz mostly, like day to day, or the rolls, or uh, uh, day to day? It's the rolls and the uh, Benz. I don't drive that car often because it gives you. Uh, I mean, when you drive on the road, it, it brings too much attention. Like some people get jealous, and some people, you know, it's. Everyone's um, trying to race you in a Honda Civic with like an exhaust. Uh, I, I mean, yeah, and they won't, you know, let me switch lanes because they're trying to take pictures and they're, you know, moving the same speed as me. So it's, yeah, got pulled over once because I couldn't get over the other lane <laughs> until the last second. <laughs> yeah. You mentioned that, uh, that people get jealous. Like, Mike, have you had like bad experiences with people or? Or do you just like think that, or like is that something that kind of happened? Or um, I think the first car I bought was the uh, McLaren, and I was parked nearby the street, and some somebody got jealous and got a, this, you know, got a, I don't think it's a pencil, but I think it's a pen, and it, you know, it scratched through the entire door. Oh. Um, and uh, yeah, that's the first time. I, then uh, that was the first time you killed a man. <laughs> <laughs> that was the first time the car got scratched by the same time. That's, that's crazy. crazy. I mean, it's very, it's very impressive what you've done with your trading, man. Because I feel like you're one of those type of guys that when the opportunity is there, you'll strike. And aside from that, you'll just wait. So how do you personally handle the FOMO of waiting for those setups? And kind of on that turn, how do you have that confidence to, you know, pull six million dollar trade out the back um 
I would say, to be honest, like everybody is struggling with our waiting game, especially in, in last year and this year. I think last year we had like five months of nothing other than bigger caps. So what I used to do is I track a, a setup that I wanted to trade, and specifically um, how many times it happened throughout the year. And each time, you know, what's my winning percentage, um, how much I'm likely to gain, how much I'm likely to lose. And you can kind of get a rough estimate to see that, you know, this is how much you're going to make by the end of the year. So once you know the numbers, you are much more patient than, you know, other traders that, uh, uh, can't you know wait for the opportunity and start forcing trades yeah, so a lot of people yeah, go for it Chuck. <clears throat> a lot of people you know tracking trades is you know it's a common thing that we've all kind of been around heard about talked about doing a lot of people do it i myself have done it i know james has done it i know harry's done it alex he just catalogs everything inside of his fucking photographic memory so <laughs> but it, what is it about your tracking that allows you to have such confidence in it? What do you think you do differently or what is it about that data that when you're looking at it, you go, yes, I have to go big on this? <laughs> um, with high risk. First of all, it's the winning percentage of the pattern. So uh, after you track you know, a couple thousand tickers, all together, you will kind of know what's the winning percentage, what's it likely to happen, and um, it's not just the tracking of the of the data. I sometimes I record uh, the moment of the stock tends to shift its momentum. Let's say it breaks down or breaks out, then then you can remember or try to memorize that level too. So you can kind of get a feeling of you know when the stock is about to break down or break out. Um, but typically, with how much size I'm likely to go in it usually starts with um minimize your risk so whenever you are let's say you want to short a stock and you not just by focus on your own risk you also want to look at the chart it, look at the chart that to think um you know what you know what's the top short setters likely to take an entry on and most of them will likely to minimize their risk uh, almost to zero. So whenever you are shorting a stock and if there is a, a specific uh, resistance or there's pre-market resistance um, and they want to minimize their risk up to zero or there's an intraday parabolic, they always want it to size in into a push and that's when you see a massive stuff uh, into one candle and that's where momentum tends to shift. Um, and whenever you are finding that point, I call it net zero point. So if you find that point and you can get in with pretty big size with a little bit of a risk, uh, that's where I started to um, pounding up my size. Once I get the first uh, pullback or you know, as soon as I go in and when, when it pulls back about 15%, the momentum tends to shift, I will uh, cover decent amount of my size to get a some of um, some of the gains. Then I will start adding the bounces. This way, I will have a little bit of cushion of playing throughout the day, and that's where the profit tends to uh, tends to grow and snowball. It's unbelievable. I think that's like, is it hard for you then when you have the opportunity to short with such size, like a DWAC or something like that? then day to day, like, has it become almost like not enjoyable for you? Like, I know it's still making money every day, but like how you can't quite obviously use the same size day to day. So how does that work for you? Uh, yeah, not the same size, but um, I don't really use the same size on, you know, on, on, DWAC, like on every single ticker. Uh, I track patterns specifically and categorize, uh, categorize them into, uh, into different sections. Uh, for example, like uh, lower floats with lower cap, uh, market cap. And uh, when they are trading specific volume, you can um, you can kind of calculate. Well, first of all, you do not want to exceed 10% uh, of the float, 1% of the volume. That's something, that's a rule that I typically uh, play throughout the day. And once you don't exceed that number, um, 
then you once you trade it for a decent amount of time, you will kind of find out, um, uh, especially going into intraday patterns, not multi-day runners, but uh, intraday, uh, our low flow can only <clears throat> sometimes handle 500,000 positions, 600,000 positions. If you go more than that, it's, it's first, first of all, you are taking too many shares. I mean, you are once you go over ten percent of the flow, you are going to affect the price. And to be able to exit into that stock, you are basically pushing up the bid uh, in such a large range. Then you know you cannot get out at the point that you wanted. Um, so with different patterns, you have to kind of know that first of all, what's the max size you can go in before. <clears throat> uh, before you cannot get out uh, at the point that you wanted. Um, that's for intraday patterns. Then if you go into multi-day patterns, then you kind of have to go through all that data again to see um, what's the maximum size you can go in. I have those, uh, most of the time I have those sides figured out already. So let's say I go into an intraday pattern, I look at this ticker, check out the flow, check out the market cap, check out the val uh, volume. I would know that, okay, well, 600K is about the max I can size in. Then um, if I win, I will, get, I will probably make up to 100K to 150K uh, in my trade. Wow. Did you learn that early on that you, like, did you ever make that mistake? Did you ever take too much size according to the float and like just really put yourself in a bad spot? Or is this something you kind of knew from the beginning if you were uh, mistake, what you had to do? Oh, definitely made mistakes before. Yes, I have take, uh, taken, uh, I, I would say, uh, I think it was 15% of the float. Um, and uh, yeah, it was, it was not very good. I think I took like 40% losses on it. I was trying to get out uh, with only 15% risk. And I, I, after I completely got out, I took like 43% losses. So it's, do you ever swing these positions short multi-day? Uh, for example, it doesn't have to be DWAC, but you know, if any of these stocks that you're shorting, okay, you locked in 100K, 200K. Do you still keep maybe 50K shares, 100K shares for two, three, four days more? Or are you mostly like, you know what, let me get out, let me sleep well, and I'll just hit it again in the morning? Um, I keep it. Um, so I only hold positions maximum in one day. Uh, so just one one night then covering the next day um typically uh when with those uh swing positions going into multi days i will cover about i think 75 percent 75 percent of my size and if the ticker trades crowded enough volume typically there's a bounce uh coming in the, in the next day so i keep that 25 percent at mainly is for the average so it can add in the second day uh, make sure that my average is really high and going to stay positive throughout the day. So once your average is pretty high, you are not, you know, in terms of your entry and exit, you will probably not get nervous when the stock is bouncing in the second day. Yeah, maybe we can uh, kind of switch gears a little bit and talk about the recent sector that we had, uh, AI. Um, did you trade any AI tickers? Um, did you trade any China tickers? Um, maybe you can kind of talk about that. Maybe you didn't trade any at all. Uh, I trade. I traded all of them. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's, maybe uh, trade some. Okay, trade all of them. I mean, it's been a pretty exciting, exciting. I don't know. It's the last two months. Starting. I mean, the AI wasn't as uh, wasn't as crazy as the last one. Top. Yeah. So. Uh, for, for the AI sector, I think I took, um, I took, I think the biggest loss I took was CXAI on the bounce, not on the on the first initial round. But I think it's, I think it topped around seventy, consolidated around fifteen ish. Uh, then I think it was uh, on that green day right there. Uh, yeah, right there. That <laughs> That's the loss I took because you know uh, the resistance is so. The resistance range is so wide. Um, that's where I was taking paper cuts, little by little, little by little. Uh, I think that was 140, 140 losses, 140k losses. Um, I think that's the loss I took specifically to the AI sector. 
<laughs> that I consider uh, that resistance range to be like 13 to like 20? Or would you consider uh, it to be like a little bit higher? Uh, 15 ish, I think. 15 ish, you'd consider yeah. that to be like yeah. more so kind of the resistance. Yeah, it topped around 10, uh, 11, three times. So I shorted it on the third time when it was panicking. Um, you zoom in, and uh, when it reversed, that's where I cut my losses. So this was after the first initial run on the initial run of cxai when gfai sai all these crazy stocks were going were you uh attacking during that time as well no i, I know i did not attack it uh i knew that this is the first sector uh, that everybody wants to get their hands on um because typically when you have a long you know a long period of time of nothing and a lot of people tends to go very aggressive on those stickers so um, I think I attacked it on the on the backside for uh, GFAI. I think I made 300, 400 on, on the backside. That's pretty good. This is a, a bit of a psychology question, but from someone like you who has had such success on shorting like DWAC and like other sectors, how do you keep yourself from getting like overexcited on the way up? Because like you obviously, you were very patient on the way up. And then when you hit it on that bounce day, how do you not force yourself to, you know, taking on too much risk too fast. And like, cause you seem to do really well at risk management and like keeping your losses really small compared to your wins. And I think it's impressive, but how do you kind of keep your mental state when the trade is actually happening? Okay. Okay. So, um, there's one thing that I typically tip, uh, keeping track of is, um, I split market cap and flow into different sections. So let's say, uh, if the ticker started with under 100 million uh, market cap, and t t and when it then once it did its multi-day round, you track on the top of the candle to see. Typically, on the uh, on the highest day volume, it is the top. So uh, you can kind of track how much money was traded in that top of the candle. Um, then after that, you can use that as reference to trade pretty much all of the multi-day rounders in the same sections. So. Uh, if the initial market cap is under 100 million. Let's say um, the top of the candle uh, traded 30 million shares, uh, around 50 shares, and that's 1.5 billion in terms of dollar uh, dollar amount. Then you can use that dollar amount to uh, calculate if the multi day runner tends to uh, finish its run for the day or it still has continuous uh, volume that's going to come in on the second day. So let's say today, um, so the so number we got um, is 1.5 billion. And today only traded maybe 500 million, 700 million. So there's a high chance that the, the ticker is likely to go up another day. And once you know that, you'll be pretty patient to wait. So, so you're very data driven. You're, you're really looking at the stats. You're looking at the data. You're making sure that you understand if it fits the criteria, if it doesn't fit the criteria. That's it's really it's really key because I feel like a lot of people in trading, they just think like, hey, you show up, you buy the stock, you short the stock and it's going to go up. Maybe it's going to go down. But you are very data driven to be able to say, hey, you know what? I've seen this pattern occur 1000 times. There's a 90 percent win rate. I know that the float is X. So that means that my size is Y. And based on the win rate that I've had in the past, I could do this. So I think that that's very helpful to a lot of people to understand that you're treating this very professionally. You're not waking up and winging it. You're not just gambling, rolling the dice. You are treating it very, very, very high level professionally. But, you know, it's a whenever, even though I you know, do data up to the extreme, I still make mistakes. So I can't imagine people don't do data. You know, how many mistakes they make. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Going into like, going to TOP, especially into the last two, almost two weeks ago. TOP, uh, I was talking to the owners of different brokerage. There's a firework blowing up for different accounts. I think people, a lot of people went negative equities on this ticker. <laughs> um, that is crazy, Chard. <laughs> yeah. And I think I personally took, um, I think it was 200K, not 200K, 140K. So 140K on the first day. Not on, uh, no, not, not, not on that day, the previous day. So yeah, right. 
Um, the after hours are in there. Yeah, so I showed it in the consolidations around, I think it was around 20, at 19. Uh, after it didn't break down, that's where I covered by the end of the day. So that last candle is where I exited. My size was pretty big. So I think it was, I think I had like 70K shares. Um, wow. And that's was where that I, you pushing it up after hours? Uh, no, 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 no. <laughs> I, 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 uh, I exited right before uh, the market closed. And then that's where I wanted to go long. And I had my hands on the trigger. I didn't pull it. But, if you went uh, long, you would have retired, bro. Um, <laughs> I probably won't catch the top, to be honest. I'll probably exit around 30 and leave a little bit of size and goes all the way up to like 200. Very little size. Yeah, so this um, candle had 125,000. So Ducks was like 60% of that candle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's me right there. <laughs> Ducks right here. That's Ducks. Yeah. <laughs> How do you deal with those losing days? Like, what do you do to release stress? Because trading could be very stressful. Like the good days are never as good as the bad days are bad. So I feel like at least in the high level trading, when you're talking about six, seven figures, maybe even eight figures, there's gonna be some really bad days that come along. So how do you personally release stress? How do you manage stress? Do you have any advice for people that are stressed in their trading? Um, I mean, I get stressed and I, I, um, if I get a bad trade, I go take a walk or go to the gym, uh, do some meditations, you know, whatever works for you. Drive a 1600 uh, horsepower car. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, see, some of these things aren't available to us peasants, but I get it. <laughs> but, you know, you see, the, the hardest part to really you know, for stress, I think, in you know, this almost like nine years of trading, is to actually face your own mistake. A lot of people that when they made a bad trade, they don't want to, you know, go back to their trade. Or they don't want to go back and look at their constant of what you know stupid things they did while their place, you know, their their entry and exit. Uh, the hardest part is for me to like actually admit that I made a mistake, not finding excuses of oh yeah, the stock is manipulated, the stock is this or whatever. You know, when the stock is always going to be manipulated and it's up to you to manage your own risk, you can do whatever to, you know, you can even do uh, counter strategies against those uh, people that are trying to manipulate stock. So it's when you take a loss and you know, the, the mistake is on you, it's not on other people. And a lot of people tend to find excuses. Um, yeah. So you talked about being a trader now for nearly nine years. I don't know if you remember that. I'm sure you do remember this, but back in the day of Profitly, there was this guy that I recognized that had a picture of the Hulk and he was just quietly making better trades after better trades after better trades. And then it turns out it was this guy named Stephen Ducks. And I was like, what the hell is this? So what was it during those times that allowed you to gain such consistency? What did you do in the beginning? And then when you figured that out, how did you stick to it? Um, so the one, I think the timing that finally clicked, it was, you know, I went back and looked all through all of my trades and I was be able to distinguish which one is, uh, which which trades is necessary to place, even though it's a loss. Which trade is you know considered to be an over trade. And once I filter out you know all of the losses, all of the gains, that's uh, that that's the opportunity that I have to place a uh, entry and exit, uh, and get rid of all of the over trading and what are, what is considered not to be tradable. Then I recalculate the profit, and you know what? It's about ten times ten times higher than the ones that I have right now. So that's where I just stopped completely on over trading, filter out all of the trades that does not filter the criteria and only stick to the trades that I know. And I know which loss it's, you know, when I take a loss on the trade, I know if it's necessary or not. Um, and, you know, some of the losses are unavoidable some because you know, it's, you're sizing it into an 80% winning percentage and it just happened to hit a 20%. 
know, it's that type of losses are not uh, avoidable, but it's manageable. You know, it's uh, as long as it's under your risk risk management, you're okay with that. Um, and you know, long run, uh, without overtrading, fitting your criteria, and you know, you are always going to take losses. You know, as long as you know, it, it's under your risk management, and always, uh, um, you should be fine. In your trading yeah. career. Um, I think uh, you kind of mentioned at the start, like the past two years, obviously, haven't been as ideal than the couple before them. Um, and maybe you can kind of talk about like what setups are working right now and like what types of, uh, you know, things are working for you in this kind of environment. Okay. <laughs> so there's two things I found out. I just personally, my own opinion after observing in the last two years. Um, first, uh, first of all is trading become definitely became more competitive than usual compared to 2021. So it's a lot harder for short sellers to, uh, I would say to, you know, actually make money compared to 2021. And there is a long term, there's a long time of uh, period of time that there's completely nothing. And every single person, even me, got a little bit, you know, formal because I want to place a trade. There's, you know, um, there's basically nothing to, you know, make money on. So uh, I think it was you know, last year, August, uh, then we, we had BBBY after that, it's pretty much, there's pretty much nothing. So uh, the volume in the market is more as it condensed or concentrated in one place. And when there, whenever there is a ticker that came in, it's HKD or BBBY, all of the volume suddenly concentrated all together. But on the intraday volume, it's been declining in the last two years consistently. So what I tracked that in 2021, 2020, the intraday uh, maximum dollar can be traded is up to 1 billion. Then going into February, it would become 700 million. If you go into uh, uh, May or June, it becomes 500 million. The lowest we actually got is actually 250 million. So in terms of intraday volume, uh, we dropped uh, intraday dollar amount being traded, we dropped 75% compared to 2020, uh, 2021. So what do you that, think that's attributed to? Do you think it's people that are just losing all their money because they were apes on AMC and GME or hodling onto everything? Or what exactly is it? It's, uh, it's, uh, the like it's, the the, <laughs> it's the raising interest, man. <laughs> Everybody be putting money, putting their money up, you know, on the raising interest. You know, they're getting more financial pressures than usual, so they can't find out. They don't have enough money to trade. That's on. I mean, that's what I think. And whenever uh, there's something come up, and you know, usually it's the first one or two trade after a long period of time of nothing. There's a really intense squeeze. HKD went up twenty six hundred, and you know, TOP went up to two hundred, and Usually the edge comes right after that. So uh, either there's a sympathy play, uh, it was MEGL um, going into the second day, uh, shorting against the pre-market resistance. Um, yeah, that's typically where the edge is. And after that, it depends on uh, what I typically re uh, you know viewing is short sellers typically has a lot more money than the buyers. So whenever there's a squeeze, you know, big squeezer coming in, uh, the shorts get squeezed. So the short sellers deposit money into the buyer's bank account, and the buyer's gonna use them to do it again because they think they can, you know, pull off another TOP. So then the short sellers go in uh, to get their money back. See, this is you know what happens pre uh, in the last eight years. It has not changed at all. So the only problem is as a short seller uh, for, uh, to, to, for you to distinguish compared to other people is you don't screw up on the first run and you will be able to pull money after um, you know, the stock produces edges and you know, be patient enough to catch the edge after the stock finishes squeezing. Even though you can, sometimes you can completely avoid although you know, when, the, when the TOP is 
going up to uh, to going up to 200 or HKD, you just don't touch it and you just wait because you know short sellers screwed up and the buyers will come back for more. So that's where you can uh, make your money up. That's where typically I make most of my money. That's really interesting. Uh, brilliant, brilliant. Yeah, but how did you do on, uh, did you trade ASNS? ASNS. The one yesterday? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, I made 140. No. <laughs> uh, 210, 210, yeah, 210. Nice. So what, uh, that, that's sort of kind of the explanation that you were talking about. You let TOP run, and then you wait for those other little ones, like you were saying, MEGL, which tries to turn into the next TOP. And then, for example, with ASNS was one of those where, you know, you had MINM and all of those other ones going wild and you waited for this bounce play on ASNS. So on these bounce plays and the lower volume, how are you adapting to that? Okay, so there's one rule that you know, I, kind of, I kind of track those uh you know, we call this uh, hyped up play. So we, you know, we have a bunch of those, uh, like the marijuana sector back in 2018, the shipping, uh, the DRYS shipping sector, you know, all the HKD Bitcoin and all those uh, Chinese stocks. Um, one thing that, especially during those hyped up sector, uh, you want uh, the first round to trade enough volume before you go in on the second bounce. So um, <laughs> if on the first day, on that first round, it, do, it did not trade enough volume, you have to wait some type of consolidations or fake out on, uh, for the second bounce. If there is actual volume traded and there's consolidations, yeah, go ahead and go ahead and you know, hammer, that, hammer that size in. But if it's without volume, if it's under 10 million uh, microflow, and he does, uh, uh, I think it was the ticker, it just it's just a full parabolic and you know ninety percent drop so there's no actual uh, entry for you to take. Uh, that's the chart you have to wait for um, fake hour consolidations to be able to make money on. It's amazing, Stephen. Th does it ever stress you out as we were talking about how the market's changing uh, a lot now? Is a lot less participants in volume. Does it ever stress you out or like concern or worry you at all that like eventually some of these setups won't work? Do you continuously track new setups? Or is this something you feel like generally over the course of your lifetime will always kind of happen? Uh, of what? And, you know, the market is always changing. Sometimes it annoys me too. Like, uh, <laughs> the one today, what was the ticker called? Um, the one, uh, what was today? Carvana? No, not Carvana. The, uh, the one went up with uh, WAL. Pack uh, W. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Think, yeah. If you go if you go back to that chart and what is you PACW Yeah PACW yeah PACW yes yeah. sir so if you go back to that chart and you compare it with the chart FRC it look exactly the same on the second day and it triple topped uh, so so FRC triple topped at 50 and did a consolidation went down and uh, I think that's where I shorted it. Uh, today, it did same exactly consolidation, triple top at five. And uh, that's where I pulled my size. That's where I went in. I think it's around five. When it broke that, you know, I took a loss. I mean, there's nothing you can do because it fits, you have to manage your risk. Um, First top, second top, and the, the third one on that red candle, that's where I sized in. And as soon as you reverse, I just covered and uh, went all the way up to six. So um, I think one thing that's still in the market is whenever the stock is on parabolic, never try to size in into the parabolic and the stock is crowded. So let's say before 1030, you already traded 40 million shares. Um, 40 50 million shares so going to the rest of the day it's going to trade more than 100 million shares where is that where is that uh 60 million shares rest of the 60 million shares going to go you know when this stock is trading that crowded and no matter how good you are as a you know as a short setters you won't know how far this thing can go so typically whenever 
you know, you're seeing two similar charts, you want to size in at the same place, and but it uh, it breaks your risk, you have to take the loss. So uh, that's uh, for P, I think PACW today, yeah. Are there, uh, are there any traders that you kind of like learned a lot from or were able to kind of like piggyback off of when you were first starting? Like, uh, I know somewhere I saw like that, like you and Tim Grittani are friends, you've talked with him before. Um, did you ever like kind of learn anything from him or where was most of your stuff just yourself, like just tracking? Uh, yeah, I would say most of my stuff is self tracking. I talk to Tim all the time. Um, uh, I, I, yeah, I talk to him. I mean, we've been friends for like a couple of years now. And, uh, we also live in the same place uh, back in, back in when I was in Ohio, he lives in Columbus. I live in Cincinnati and, uh, we know we talk about trading all the time and uh you know, sometimes i get what he what he is thinking sometimes you know i yeah kind of i kind of you know take off his ideas and to think okay what well, does it fit the you know, does it fit the trading logic or not if it doesn't fit then it's over to me if it fits the trading logic and if i just something i don't understand then i will ask him and he will explain what he's you know thinking process so so yeah, can we go ahead he, Harry. He, He's mostly kind of like a long, well, now he's doing like a lot of longs and you're mostly like a lot of shorts. So like when he talks to you, are you like, yeah, I understand that. I get that kind of like multi-day breakout setup, or are you more like this confuses the hell out of me? Uh, it doesn't confuse me because when he gets in, he gets in, you know, uh, for example, 6 AI, he gets in like one, one, one daughter or something. Um, so, you know, I mean, that's the point I would definitely not short. <laughs> and, and, and so, so typically, you know, he will ask me, "Hey, ducks, where are you gonna short?" And I'll tell him this price. So that's where you're gonna sell, it's and then, then that's where he sells. <laughs> that's oh, you know, where, where, where do you think this can go? I would just give him. Awesome. So, so can of, we take a look at this uh, ASNS real quick, just to kind of review here? I think this was, or not ASNS, uh, MINM. This was that bounce situation you were mentioning and how you were talking about how you don't touch any of these things unless they trade at least 10 million volume. So if we take a look here at MINM, this was one of the, the, the China plays that was running with everything. Um, and this was one that actually traded over that 10 million number Whereas if we look at ASNS, it was 2 million and it had the ability to break that high. So yeah. what, what you're kind of getting at here is that if it traded more than 10 million shares, the chances that there are still people that are bagged up top, once this finally bounces, you're saying basically that this volume isn't going to be able to overpower the bag holders. Am I understanding that correctly? Beautiful. Yes, there's a high chance that intraday run will not, you know, beat the back holders on the first round. It'll start hitting all of that where it where everything crashed off, and that'll turn into all the resistance that you're playing off of. Yeah, yeah. So how do you sit there and wait for that opportunity? Uh, you just toss some orders out there and just go. Well, we'll see. No, 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 no. I never toss orders over there. Yet. Uh, I think you just so, triggered so, him, Joe. So, <laughs> so, uh, go, go ahead, look at the chart. Uh, yeah. For, if you go into intraday on the second round. Uh huh. So, on that first spike, you see there is no consolidations. Uh, right. And on that on the top, what's the reason of you shorting there? You know your risk uh, compared to the resistance. Go ahead, look at the resistance. Probably you know, it's so far from where the parabolic is. Right. You got it. Yeah. You're talking and, at least eight before it ever hits any kind of the first consolidation whatsoever. I mean, I the way I look at it on the first round, there's no consolidation. Gotcha. Yeah. So first of all, you, you know the first top it doesn't have any type of reason for you to short because you know there's no risk for you to manage then going to the second breakout up to eight still there's no type of consolidations for you to manage until it consolidates the stock consolidate consolidated between that six to seven um and that's where 
you're supposed to find your entry, just as in risking the top of that eight. Typically, I risk the 75% uh, of where of the uh, consolidation range. So it's between, I think it's around six to six to eight. So the range of that, so the 75%, um, which is probably around uh, 750, 750 area. The sitting five percent of the consolidation range. Oh yeah, so it's a two dollar range, right? And so seventy five percent of that would put it at seven fifty. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. And then you risk you you're aiming to enter around that seven fifty. No, I'm that's my risk. Ah, okay. I'm probably gonna enter between uh, I think the six six seventy six fifty. Gotcha. Okay. Awesome. That's amazing. Steve, I have a question for you. So you just listening to you talk about trading, I mean, you're obviously a freaking savant and a hundred times smarter than I am, but, uh, <laughs> but so you get so involved and so in depth in your setups and your strategies and everything. Do you do that outside of the market with other investments? Like are there other things that you try to put money into and like, do you get as analytical about those things as well? Or is it really just trading that kind of gets your brain kind of like like how it is now? Or video games, like or something like this for you? Uh, StarCraft is very similar. <laughs> StarCraft. I, yeah, I play a lot of StarCraft. And it's <laughs> it's about guessing what people are doing, you know? And uh, it's very similar. You have to kind of guess where the back order is. You have to, you have to know that you know where the short setter is, what level will make them nervous. And that's typically where the short squeeze is. And knowing where the buyer is, you you know what level will get them nervous to sell. You know where the short seller is, you will know what level where you know, they will likely to cover their position to get nervous. So all these has to be combined with your strategy. You know, it has to be data driven. But uh, by you know, observing the market, you will you know you will have an idea of the buyers and sellers is and uh, use your data. And typically, when those to one psychology, one pattern, when they are leaning towards the same direction, that's when the pattern have the highest winning percentage. So. so what did you do to practice to get so good at that kind of that level of intuition? Uh, <clears throat> did you just level... like sit outside of Walmart and just watch <laughs> people walk in and out and just predict what they're going to buy? <laughs> I mean, everybody behaves, uh, I would say, the same. So, you know, kind of imagine yourself and started at trading, you know, at the very beginning state as a beginner. And uh, whatever you are thinking as a beginner is typically where the buyer or the short story is. So. so what do you think somebody could do to improve that skill? What could they, what could a person do to get better at that? First of all, you have to survive because most people get blew out of market within the first year. So you have to, I think the only way I found out to you know, survive in the first two years is uh, focus on one thing that you know. Don't touch anything that you don't know. Yeah. Um, and until you grow enough capitals and uh, that's where you can spread, uh, you know, uh, spread around and finding different strategies and make sure uh, break apart your account into you know multiple different uh, you know let's say you have a 50k account you have six backup accounts so if you blow up one account you will have a second account ready to go and that's the part that's the I would say essential part especially for beginners you, you know it, to make sure you are uh, stay alive in this market as long as it gets. The longer you stay, the better you will get. So you know, never you know, try to make your money in, in, in one shot. It's 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 about experience. Yeah. Yeah. Piggyback on what James said earlier, um, you make all this money trading. Do you have any investments outside the market? Real estate uh, indexes, uh, venture capital. How do you? How do you manage your money outside the market or do you have it in your account, trading account? Uh, having a real estate, uh, making passive income, rental properties. Yeah. So you just focus on rental properties. You don't put anything into like Apple or Amazon, anything like that? No, because, you know, it's very easy to mix up with your um, you know, trading mindset. I'm, you know, when we're doing day trading, it's all short term, short term. You know, whenever you're looking at the ticker for a, for two months, 
it kind of confuses you. So, um, and typically, you know, when you take a position in Apple, when you take a position in Amazon, you know, as a trader, you definitely want to look at your positions. I mean, if you're bored, so I might as well just invest in something else. I mean, it's it's all slow. So, when you're uh, looking to short into, let's say, let's say uh, the chart that we just looked at before. Um, on that kind of resistance, are you ever paying attention to the vol or the VWAP on that day saying like, okay, I think that this is where the average price of the bag holder could be. And I want to kind of like look to short around there or do you just not pay attention to that at all? Oh, no, VWAP doesn't work. Uh, uh, I mean, <laughs> Ducks is like shots fired. Shots <laughs> fired. Here we go. <laughs> uh, VWAP works when there is concentrated volume on consolidations. View app does not work when the, when there's fully parabolic up and down. So there's Go conditions on. when 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 uh when view apps works. Yeah. So it needs yeah, to I see people on Twitter talking about this all the time that it's like, oh well we used view app from the prior day's resistance to top tick this. And, you know, I see that all the time on Twitter. And yeah. I was just wondering yeah. if that's something that you kind of saw. I mean, the, you know, a lot of people are a little bit obsessed with the indicators, you know. I mean, it's if you think about the market or, you know, from the very, I would say, fundamental as a very base level, um, first of all, uh, uh, people are placing trades and you know, when the chart moves, it's what people are, people are placing trades behind the computer. And it's all about what they're thinking, how to really counter them. So short sellers make money from the buyers and they have to know the, the psychology uh, behind the buyers. And indicators like RSI or view app, they don't have any, um, I would say, direct relationship with, you know, what, how much, uh, you know, how many shares did this buyer buy? And if they get if you get caught back holding, what's the level they're likely to sell? I mean, in those indicators doesn't have the direct relation in, uh, compared to those psychologies. Uh, so uh, the only thing indicators that, that I use volume. Uh, typically, volume indicates how many people are buying and selling. And if you are using you know the average statistics, and ninety people ninety percent people are going long, then you can kind of calculate. Okay, well at this level, there's you know this amount of uh, backholders. And when it hits to this resistance, the buyers will not beat the backholders right here because you know, on this candle's volume, it's there's not enough buyers. And when there's 10 backholders versus eight buyers, the backholders, of course, going to win. So I'm a short seller, and I'm likely to take advantage of you know, the new buyers that are likely to lose. That's how resistance works. So it's... Um, yeah, that's the, the those are the only indicators that I use. And also, one thing I want also track is, um, I think it's it just my assumption. Uh, so into like for different multi-day runners, and of course, uh, stock involves manipulations and hedge fund. Um, but at, from my assumption is, it, at, at least smart money. Whenever you are buying, let's say a low flow, I mean, you do not want to exceed 100%. You, you do want to buy the, buy up the entire flow. Sometimes it does happen, uh, but- AWX. You know, yeah, yeah, <laughs> AWX, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but you know, as smart money, you do not want to buy up the entire flow because when you are, whenever you are selling, you're just playing yourself because you're selling it you know, to yourself. So, you know, it, as a smart money, you want to sell it to other people. Right, and you make that you know, make the money while the stock is going up. So typically, you do not want to exceed uh, thirty percent or fifty percent of the flow, because we want to leave the rest of the flow to other buy you know, buyers for you to make money from. So uh, then, of this specific psych psychology applies into the multi-day runner, then there's going to be a limitation of how many uh, dollar can be traded in different market caps. So if smart money can only you know, applying 30% of the flow and there's, you know, uh, retail money going in. And you can kind of, once you look at different multi runners, you can calculate, okay, well, between 100 million or to 500 million market cap and when the stock 
goes per fully parabolic, when it consolidates, this is maximum amount of money can be traded in a consolidation. Once the, uh, it trades in a, in a certain amount and retail runs out of money, so no, no more money can be support, uh, support the bid, uh, or no more money can be added into the, the ticker for the ticker to go up even more, and then that's where you know, the chart exalts, and that's where you uh, short and take your profit. So I just have uh, just one more question real quick about uh, filings, SEC filings, because we never really yeah. talked about that yet. And um, do you ever kind of, uh, like, I know you're more of like kind of a pattern guy, but do you ever read the filings and kind of put on your tinfoil hat and say, okay, maybe they're trying to pump this up to do an offering or, okay, maybe they're trying to pump this to get to these warrants and then like maybe look to short there or are you just pure pattern, volume, don't care what's going on, don't care about offering or whatever. I'm just going to focus on what I know. Um, I have looked actually looked into those uh, filing before. It actually um, affected my, uh, I would say, judgment whenever I'm trading because I think there's few times that there's warrants around four and there's consolidations at four and people think the warrant is going off and you know selling it to stop at four dollar and a lot of people packed in shorting at four next day stock gaps up to 12. so i think um it's all about risk management and uh you know focus on what you know because there's a lot of stuff that you don't know and you can and you can potentially you know you can even trade. You can trade anything to in the market to, you know. Sometimes you're lucky to make money. So just just trade what you know, and you will make. Uh, make a killing. Make a killing, yeah. <laughs> Good answer. All right, man. So to wrap up here, we want to talk about some regular guy questions. Okay. <laughs> These have nothing to do with trading at all. This is just us getting to know Stephen Ducks, man, just to show how much of a regular guy he is outside of his genius level mindset. Um, so number one, <laughs> what was your first job? First job, I worked at a dorm. Uh, I think uh, it was, I think it was a midnight shift. So it's between <laughs> 12 a.m. to like 7 a.m. To check people in on the dorm, yeah. Oh, uh, all right. Like, uh -huh. It's like six dollar an hour. <laughs> He's come a long way, fellas. <laughs> so, what was your favorite hobby? What is your favorite hobby outside of trading? Favorite hobby? Um, I play tennis. I uh, uh, play a little bit of basketball. Play um, a lot of video games. <laughs> League of Legends, Counter Strike, whatever you name it. Uh, awesome. So, what uh, yeah. are you reading? Any books? What's your favorite books lately? Uh, I don't really read trading related books. That uh, is like our lowest answered question. <laughs> now, I don't uh, mean trading related. I just mean any books. What's your favorites? Uh, favorites. I remember recently I'm reading uh, Cas9 genetic editing. Uh, gene editing. Yeah. Wow. Ooh. That sounds um, cool. yummy. And uh, yeah, I, I like I, mean, I, I read quantum physics. Uh, they, um, there's one thing that I like I like to read that's I would say semi connected to stock is um, what's it called um, the psychology of uh, economic behavior. It's not a book. It's it, it's it's a genre, but it, it basically uh, talks about the psychology how people uh, use their use their money. Oh wow! So, oh. Yeah. So, what's yeah. your favorite? Uh, what's your favorite TV show? What do you like to watch? I I do not watch the uh, TV. I watch a lot of anime. Uh, I watch uh, what's it called? Um, I watch Naruto. Uh, Dragon Ball Z. Uh, no, I watched a little bit of Dragon Ball Z, but uh, yeah, but I watch Dragon Ball Z. We gotta get you uh, into that. Uh, what else? Yeah, I watched a lot of anime. Um, too many. Yeah, you name it, so. <laughs> What's your favorite food to eat? Uh, favorite food? Uh, I mean, I like all kinds of food. I, I'm not really picky. It, it just I can't handle uh, blue cheese. That's some. That's ooh, that's, yeah, that's ooh. <laughs> yeah. What's yeah. the most memorable vacation you've taken? Memorable vacation. 
Uh, in Madiv, I think there's a girl that oh. was drowning. Oh, no. So I, I went down trying to save her, and I almost died. What trying to swim. Trying to I swim. did not expect the story to go that I way. Didn't I, heard the girl, I heard Maldives. Yeah, <laughs> yeah trying, trying, to, trying to swim back. Uh, yeah, it was, I was cutting it close, but <laughs> wow, did she make it? No, I wasn't naked. I had, you know, had the no, 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 did she make it? Oh, did she, oh, no, oh, did she make it? <laughs> yeah, she made it. She made it. <laughs> what? She, what? No, oh my god, that's how we're gonna start the podcast. Was she naked? <laughs> um, uh, I'm I sorry, I'm totally question. off. Are you track? dating no, anyone? I don't have it. Sorry, what you are. That's cool. That's funny. <laughs> <I'm still> just, <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> Where was I at? Um, to me. Oh my God. Well, I think that's pretty much all I've got for you right there. Yeah, I think yeah. that's a great wrap right there. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Thanks for coming on, Steve. That's awesome, Steve. Thank you, dude. Thank, Thank you, you so much for being here, man. I got. I gotta go eat. So. Uh, yeah, yeah bro. Eat. Oh, thanks. For, thanks for having me. No, no, problem. Problem. no blue cheese. No, no blue cheese. cheese. No blue cheese. Yeah. <laughs> and, and keep Have your clothes on when you swim. Stay <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> closed. See you guys. See you. Later. Take care.